So just grab your Bibles once again there, just keep it open to Genesis chapter 5. And as we're going through Genesis 5, I'm sure you're wondering, how is he going to preach in this one, right? How is he going to preach in this chapter? It's all these names, the genealogy of Adam. Well, let's look at verse number 1, Genesis chapter 5, verse 1. The Bible says, this is the book of the generations of Adam. The title for the sermon this morning is The Generations of Adam, all right? So let's keep reading there, verse number 1. This is the book of the generations of Adam. In the day that God created man, in the likeness of God made he him. Male and female created he them and blessed them and called their name Adam in the day that they were created. So what I want to uh, stop there and talk about is just in verse number two, it says on the day that God created um, Adam and Eve or man and woman, he called their name Adam. Okay. So as far as God was concerned, if you remember, um, <clears throat> it's, uh, it was Adam that gave his wife her name. He called her Eve. But as far as God was concerned, he called Adam and Eve Adam, okay? You say, why is that important? Well, the reason, I don't know if you, ever, uh, if, you, if you knew this, but the reason we have the tradition when a man and woman get married, the woman takes the man's surname, okay? You know, when Christina got married, she was, before she got married, she was Christina Rodriguez. When she got married, she became Christina Sepulveda. She took on my name. And after we got married, you know, when the pastor announced us as husband and wife, he announced as, 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 uh, um, us as Mr. and Mrs. Kevin Sepulveda. Okay? And the reason we have that tradition in our Western culture is because we've taken that from the Bible. We've recognized once you've been united as husband and wife, you are one flesh, and in many ways, you are also the one name. Okay? As far as God is concerned, when he looked at Adam and Eve, he saw Adam. Okay? And when he sees me and Christina, he sees Kevin Sepulveda, we're one flesh, we're a team, we're, you know, we're not separate uh, individuals as far as God is concerned, we're part of one family unit. So I just want to show you where we get that tradition from, because I know today that there's a, there's a push to move away from that. Why do I have to take on my husband's surname? Why can't I keep my own name? Or you see the hyphen, you know, for example, if Christina wanted to keep her surname, the, the uh, culture today, many people would say, well, just call yourself Christina Rodriguez hyphen Sepulveda or something like that. <laughs> Some people do that. But when, when people start doing that, I don't, know, I don't know if they recognize they're moving away from the standard that God has. And I want you to just remember that if you're married, you're, as far as God sees you, you're one flesh. All right, husbands, whatever your wife does, you may not approve of it. You might not, might, you know, might not like it. Hey, but you're responsible. You're one flesh. You can't say to God, well, that was my wife doing it. No, you're the head of your wife. You're the head of your family. God looks down and sees Adam. All right? Let's keep reading. Verse number three. And Adam lived 130 years and begat a son in his own likeness after his image and called his name Seth. Now, you may remember when I was going through this, I said, look, Adam and Eve could have easily been in the garden for 100 years. Okay? I'm not saying he was. I'm just saying it could have easily been because he wasn't, this is the first time we get a date where, you know, Seth was born 130 years after Adam lived. Now, that might sound unusual to you. You, you know, you might get the idea, well, were they withholding from, from, relation, from relations? You know, why did it take so long for them to have children? Well, this chapter kind of gives us that answer, okay? It kind of gives us that answer why it took so long. It wasn't that there was any sort of nefarious reasons, it's just that as we go through this lineage, you will notice, you know, uh, you know son after son, as, when they start having children, they have children at a very old age, all right? Well, what we would consider an old age. But keep in mind, these people were living for hundreds of years. So we don't know exactly how their biology was. We don't know exactly how they developed. But we see a pattern. We'll see this. Just pay attention. As you look at the ages of the time they were having children, you'll notice there is definitely a pattern emerging here. All right, now let's keep reading verse number four. And the days of Adam, after he had begotten Seth for 800 years, and he begat sons and daughters. And all the days of Adam lived were 930 years, and he died. So obviously, Adam lived in 930 years, almost 1,000 years. All right, so obviously, their bodies were different. Obviously, their bodies aged differently, you know, and, uh, you know, I believe this is the reason why they had children so late. Their biology was different, okay? They developed differently to the way we understand man today. 
Now, before we get into the rest of this chapter, I want you to keep your finger there and let's go to Luke chapter 3. Luke chapter 3. We've already gone through the book of Luke, all right? And if you remember in Luke chapter 3, we have the genealogy of Jesus Christ, okay? Now, the reason I want to turn here is because the genealogy that we see of Christ parallels the genealogy that we have here, or the descendancy that we see here of Adam. It follows the same line. Go to Luke chapter 3, verse 23. Luke chapter 3, verse 23. And if you remember, this genealogy was following uh, his mother's line, Mary. Okay? Following Mary's line. Let's look at this. Luke 20, uh, 3, 23. And Jesus himself began to be about 30 years of age, being, as was supposed, the son of Joseph, which was the son of Heli. Now, I'm not going to rehash my sermon, but Heli was the father-in-law of Joseph. So, Joseph could be rightly called the son of Heli because Joseph became the son-in-law of Heli. All right? So, I'm not going to go through all of that again, but this is following the line of Mary. So, Heli was Mary's father, okay? The, the, the father-in-law of Joseph. Now, drop down to verse 36. Verse 36. And, and as we go through, we start seeing this, which was a son of, which was a son of, which was a son of. And if we look at verse number 36, it says, which was a son of Canaan, which was a son of Arphaxad, which was the son of Sem, which was a son of Noe, which was a son of Lamech, which was a son of Methuselah, which was a son of Enoch, which was a son of Jared, which was a son of uh, Meleliel, which was a son of Canaan, which was a son of Enos, which was a son of Seth, which was a son of Adam, which was a son of God. So I just want to show you there, we add, in verse number 36, it had the son of Noe. Okay, so that's Noah. That's the, that's the name that Noah is given in the New Testament. Um, and so what we see there is, as, as we look at this chapter, we're going to end on Noah. But if we backtrack, it's going to be the same lineage, obviously, that we saw in Genesis chapter 5. So it's an important lineage. It's the lineage of which Jesus Christ would ultimately be born. Okay, This is why the Bible gives us two uh, times the same lineage being followed in the Bible. So we understand that this is the line that Jesus Christ was uh, born of. Now, you're still in Luke chapter 3. Look at verse 38 again. Now, there is, there, is a, there is a phrase here in verse 38 that a lot of people struggle to understand. Okay, And I'm going to give you four options or four possibilities of interpretation of this passage. And uh, let's, uh, verse number 38, it says, "...which was the son of Enos, which was the son of Seth, which was the son of Adam." which was the Son of God, okay? So, a lot of people wonder, what does this mean? How can we rightly say that Adam was the Son of God? Okay, why isn't anyone else in the Bible, besides obviously Jesus Christ, but why isn't anyone else sort of referred to as the Son of God? Now, I'm going to go through the four options that I'm familiar with, okay? The four uh, uh, rules, and this is important as we go through, later on, as we go through the rest of this chapter, but also when we get up to Genesis chapter 6, Okay, so I'm, I'm setting some groundwork here now, so when we get to chapter 6, you know, we don't have to rehash the same kind of uh, things here. But there are four options. Let me go through the four main options that I know of, you may know of others, to understand in what sense was Adam the son of God, all right? Number one, the first one is that this verse of Adam being the son of God is, is speaking of Jesus being the son of God by extension of this family lineage, Okay. Now, the thought behind that, you guys are still in Luke uh, chapter 3. Go to Luke, Luke chapter 3, verse 31. Luke chapter 3, verse 31. Let me give you the thought behind this. Verse 31. It says, Which was the son of Meliah, which was the son of Menon, which was the son of Matatha, which was the son of Nathan, which was the son of David. So, obviously, as we read this passage, Nathan was the son of David. But we also know that Jesus Christ, many times in the Bible, is called the son of David, for example, okay? So in a sense, you might say, well, you know, you know yeah, yes, uh, we're following the lineage of this family, but you could also rightly call Jesus the son of all these other people along the way. You know, even we, we get to Abraham, and we know that there's a passage in the Bible where it talks about Jesus being the son of Abraham, okay? Or even the seed of Abraham. So that's one thought behind it. And so when we eventually get to uh, Adam, the son of God, that's really speaking by extension that Jesus, all the way from the beginning, became, is the Son of God. Okay? That's one thought behind it. Now, my problem with that interpretation um, is that, well, 
because in Luke chapter 3, we're following Mary's line, you know, we could say, you know, Heli, of course, was a father-in-law, and so Joseph was a son-of-law of Heli, but once you get to verse number, let's see, verse number, yeah, verse number 23, you, you can't say that, jo that Jesus was really the son of Heli, okay? I mean, I, I don't think there's a term that we're familiar, that, that Bible uses, that we use being uh, 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 grandson-in-law or something like that. There's, there's no kind of reference to that. So my problem is, yes, when we get to, um, by the time we get to King David, you could, in a sense, rightly say, Everyone behind that is, is uh, you could say Jesus is the son of these people, but then those that came afterwards that follow the mother's line, you can't rightly call those people the son of Jesus, uh, Jesus the son of those people. So that, that's where it falls short for me, that option, okay? Now you're wondering, why are we going for these options? I'll, I'll, make, I'll make sense of it later on, all right? So I, I reject that interpretation. I don't, I don't think that one's right, okay? I think it's a good attempt, but it's not right, okay? The second one that I'm familiar with is that Adam can be called the son of God because he was directly created by God, okay? Him having no earthly father or earthly mother, okay? And of course, Jesus Christ, the son of God, yes, when he came, born in the major, he had an earthly mother, but of course, we know that Jesus Christ is from, all, from, is from eternity past, and he has no father and mother in that sense, okay? But if we have a look at, if we consider that, the reason some people take this approach is what well, Adam can be called the son of God because he was directly created by God, is then they expand that to say, well, the angels, they were created directly by God, and so the angels can be called the sons of God as well. Okay? So when you have that interpretation, directly created by God without earthly father and mother, therefore they're, they're sons of God, then you consider Adam being the son of God, you consider angels being the son of God, Say, well, why don't you take that approach? Because they're not the only beings that were created directly by God without father and mother, okay? Because in Genesis, the book of Genesis, we see the, the, the land animals being made out of the earth. We see the, the, the uh, whales, the fish, the, the, uh, the birds being made out of water. They also, the first dog, you know, the first whale, the first shark, they were also created directly by God, okay? They had no earthly father and mother then why don't you call them sons of God? Of course, no one would, all right? So that, that falls short. You, you cannot remain consistent with that view, that you, you're called the son of God because you were directly created by God without, natural, without an earthly mother and father. Otherwise, you'd say all the animals, the first animals anyway, were sons of God as well, okay? And nobody sort of, you know, makes that claim. But that's what you'd have to do if you were to remain consistent with that view. So I don't, I don't believe that view either. The third option, why is Adam called the son of God here, is similar to option number two with a bit of a twist, okay? So the third option, and I think this one's a good option, it's not, it's not my favorite option, but I think it makes sense, is once again, yes, Adam can be called the son of God because he had no earthly father or mother, but also because he was created in the image of God, okay? Because Adam was created in the image or the likeness of God, and had no earthly father or mother, then potentially that's why he can be called the son of God. Because once again, if you guys, oh, you don't need to turn there. Where can I get you to turn? I'll get you guys to turn to Hebrews chapter 1, please. Hebrews chapter 1, you can move away from the book of Luke. Hebrews chapter 1. But while you're turning there, I'm going to read to you from 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4. It says, Lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. We know that Adam, in Genesis chapter 1, was created in the image of God. The Bible also tells us that Jesus came in the image of God. You guys are in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1. Let's have a look at this. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1. God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners, spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, <coughs> have in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he have appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. So we see that uh, Adam, something was similar with Adam and Jesus Christ, you know, 
they didn't ha- uh, have the earthly father or mother, because we know, once again, remember, Jesus was before his birth, on the, on, on, but they, were also, uh, they, were, they also came in the likeness or in the image of God. Okay? So potentially that could be re- the reason why Adam is called the Son of God, and of course why we call Jesus Christ the Son of God as well. Now the problem that I have with that position, or oh, no, it's not a problem. I don't have a problem with that position at all. I think that's a solid interpretation. That's a solid interpretation. But remember, there are some that want to call the angels, the heavenly hosts, the cherubs, the seraphs, the sons of God as well. Now, if you hold to this position, which I think is solid, you'll see, you can understand now why angels would not be considered the sons of God. Well, why? Well, first of all, yes, they were created by God. They had no sort of earthly father or mother in that sense, okay? But they were not created in the image or the likeness of God. When we were going through Genesis chapter 1, we saw that the only created beings that were made in the image of God was man, okay? And by extension, obviously, woman, because she was taken out of man, okay? So, and, and, and then we have scriptures that confirm for us that Jesus Christ was made, or not made, but Jesus Christ is the image of God the Father, okay? And so once again, we can say, hey, this is consistent. We can be consistent with this, but when we, we, we take this approach then that cannot include angels because the Bible never confirms or says to us, you know, that angels were created in the image of God, all right? Now, the fourth position, which is my position, okay? Now, there's nothing wrong with the third position. I think it's pretty good. I don't think these two positions are mutually exclusive. I actually believe you can hold to, to, to option number three and four at the same time without any contradiction. But my view of option number four is that Adam is called the son of God because he was the first man to be saved, okay? Because he was the first man to be saved. And you guys remember the story. When Adam and Eve sinned, when they had, when they had uh, eaten from that tree of knowledge of good and evil, that they were ashamed. They had sin, right? They tried to cover themselves. And what did God do? God came and provided a covering. God came and shed the blood of an animal, and they accepted that covering. They accepted what God had prepared for them, as a covering of the sin and shame. So they place their faith on God's um, you know, way of covering sin and shame. And so Adam and Eve became the first people that ever needed salvation. They're the first people that ever got saved. Okay? So in that sense, that would make sense with the rest of the Bible as we're familiar with it, especially the New Testament, because all of us, can, we can all call ourselves children of God. We can all call ourselves sons and daughters of God because we believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, because we've all been saved as well. So that would remain consistent with that, that Adam is called the Son of God because he was the first person to be saved. All right? Now, you guys, if I, you guys, now you guys can stay in, in Hebrews chapter 1. And uh, let me just think about this. Can you keep your finger in Hebrews chapter 1 and turn to, and turn to uh, Galatians chapter 3, please? Galatians chapter 3. <clears throat> And while you're turning, I'm just going to read to you from John chapter 1, verse 12. The Bible says, But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. So we can all become the sons of God when we believe on Jesus Christ. Okay? And then it says, Which were born, not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. So the reason we're called the sons of God is because we were born of God. We were born again. And that new man that is born in us, that can be rightly called the son of God. All right? You guys are going to Galatians chapter 3, verse 26. Galatians 3, 26. The Bible also says, For ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. So how do you become a child of God? You place your faith, you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, okay? And uh, if you guys can go, just move your, take, take your finger and go back to Hebrews chapter 1, please. Back to Hebrews chapter 1. We'll continue reading that passage that we were reading. But the reason I believe this is so important to understand this, and this is my position, I believe the reason he's called the Son of God is because he was saved. <clears throat> because if you remember in Genesis 4, 26, the, the last verse before we, uh, in la- last week when looking at the last verse, it said, And to Seth, obviously Adam's son, to him also there was born a son, 
and he called his name Enos. Then, then began men to call upon the name of the Lord. Okay? And we talked about how that was a, 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 a spiritual lineage through Adam to Seth to Enos and, and following that this family line would be believers. This family line would call upon the name of the Lord. And so this family line could be rightly called the sons of God. All right? Now look at Hebrews chapter 1, verse 4. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 4. So, what about the angels? You know, do we consider angels then in the, with this option, with this option number four, this way of interpretation? Hebrews chapter 1, verse 4. Being made so much better, remember we're talking about Jesus Christ, being made in the image of God, being made so much better than the angels, as he hath by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. For unto which of the angels said he at any time, Thou art my son? This day have I begotten thee, and again I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. So the Bible says here, you know, and he's comparing Jesus Christ to the heavenly hosts. He's comparing Jesus Christ to the angels and saying that Jesus Christ is so much better. You know, he's the creator of all things. In fact, he's God. We see in this chapter later on. But it's comparing the angels, and it says that God never said to the angels, Thou art my son. Okay? He never said to the angels, here, and he shall be to me a son. Okay? We don't have any references in the Bible that ever calls angels the sons of God. Okay? And I know there is a, there is a teaching, there is a belief out there that's quite, quite prominent. You know, I, I came from a church uh, that had two pastors, that I was there for nine years, two pastors, right? We had one pastor who believed the sons of God were just believers, and obviously Jesus Christ, through Jesus Christ, we can become sons of God. We had another pastor that believed that angels were also the sons of God. All right, so it's quite prominent, and it's not like it was ever a big issue or anything like that. And it's like it's not like we saw the pastors fight about it in church or something like that. Okay, but uh, there were a lot of Christians that actually believe this that angels are the sons of God, but the Bible never teaches this. Okay, so when we look at those four options, I don't know if there's any other options to understand uh, as Adam as the son of God, but when you look at the first two, you can't remain consistent with those positions. And when you look at options three and four, which you can remain consistent with, both times it doesn't include the angels. You, you cannot include the angels within that category. Okay? Say, so why, why are you talking about this? When we get to the next chapter, you'll understand a little bit more. Okay? But look at, um, look at verse number, sorry, what did we read? Verse number six, Hebrews chapter one, verse six. And again, when he bringeth in the first begotten into the world, that's Jesus Christ, he saith, and let all the angels of God worship him. Okay? So the first begotten means that there are other begotten of God. Right? If he's the first begotten, there must be other people that are begotten of God. There must be other people that are born of God. That's us. Okay? It's through the power of Jesus Christ as the first begotten, we have the ability of being born again. Okay? Let's drop down to verse number 14 now. We won't read the whole chapter. But verse number 14, it says here, are they not all ministering spirits, speaking of the angels, sent forth to minister for them who shall be the heirs of salvation? You know what you are? You are an heir of salvation. You know what the angels are to you? They're there to minister to those that are heirs of salvation. Does that, what's that saying then? That the angels are not heirs of salvation. Okay, because if they were, yeah, I guess they could be called the sons of God, but they're not heirs of salvation. Jesus Christ came to die for man and woman, not to die for angels or any other creatures, okay? So, why have I spent so much time here? Once again, uh, just to, you know, I'm not really trying to come to give you a dom dogmatic lesson. This is why Adam is called the son of God. I'm just trying to give you the, op the options out there and show you why the angels cannot be considered the sons of God. That, come, that becomes important as we go to, get into the next chapter, all right? But, what I also, the other reason I want to look at this, guys, is just to show you as we go through this, this genealogy in chapter 5, it's such a beautiful thing that we can see a genealogy of saved people. Okay? Now, I don't know if all these men were great men of God. We know a couple of them were. We know a couple of them in this chapter are prophets, are preachers of God. I don't know if they were all great men of God. But one thing that we definitely see is that the fear of God the gospel was being passed down generation to generation. And what I like about this chapter 
is so many times in the Bible, you see other great men of God, you know, prophesying, doing great works, doing great wonders, but then they turn out to be lousy fathers. Okay, they, they, don't, they, they, they don't pass down uh, the teachings, the doctrines to the children. Their children grow up without having a fear of God. I mean, just one that comes to my mind is Samuel, the prophet Samuel, great man of God, you know, used mightily by God, but his children, you know, they messed up. You know, I, I feel like, you know, do we blame the children or do we blame the parenting? I think we blame the parenting. Right? Eventually, the children get to an age where they're responsible, but at the end of the day, if Samuel had done a good job, his children would have also followed after uh, his ways. And so, what I get encouragement by here, this guys, is we see generation of generation of generation passed down, calling upon the name of the Lord until we get to Noah, okay? And we see that Noah lived, we see this next chapter, that he lived in, in terrible times, you know, in, in horrible days, and yet he still had the grace of God upon him, all right? So, an encouragement to you guys, please, fathers, mothers, pass down what you've learned to your children, you know, you know, encourage them, show them the fear of God. Discipline your children with the rod of correction when they disobey, okay? That's going to cause them to understand if mom and dad will correct me, surely God will when I sin, when I break his laws, and, and bring about that fear of God into their lives. Psalm 103, you don't need to turn there. Psalm 103 verse 17 says, but the mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting upon them that fear Him and His righteousness unto children's children. You see, God wants to have mercy on your children and on your children's children. But why is that? It said, upon them that fear Him. You have to teach your children the fear of God. Okay? Proverbs 13 verse 22 says, A good man liveth an inheritance to his children's children, and the wealth of the sinner is laid up for the just. Hey, what inheritance are you leaving for your children and your children's children? You say, well, I've got a house, I've got investment property, I've got money in the bank, I've got... Well, I mean, if you've got those things for your kids, that's good, I'm not against that. But what, what inheritance do you think is so much more important? Obviously, the inheritance of salvation. Obviously, the inheritance that comes, uh, the, the eternal rewards in heaven, that comes first and foremost. And if you teach your children right, you teach them to fear God, you teach them to follow after the commands of God, they have the new man in them. God can lead them, they can walk in the Spirit, then they're going to pass that teaching down onto their children. And if you live long enough, you'll be able to see your grandchildren. Not only can your children teach their children, hey, you can teach your grandchildren. And if you're blessed long enough, you can see your grandchildren, your, your, your great-grandchildren, your great-grandchildren, right? And if you're really blessed, you might be able to see your great, great grandchildren. And there's some people that see them, right? And you can still have an influence on these people. And uh, the reason I bring that up is because obviously Adam lived long enough to know Lamech. Okay? And then we look at these generations, we say, okay, they lived this long, they had these kids. It seems like they passed away and they move on. But really, Adam lived long enough to know Lamech, who was uh, Noah's father. Okay? So I have no doubt that not only was this passed down generation to generation, but we always had, you know, grandfather, great-grandfather, great-great-grandfather, you know, passing down the teachings of God, passing down the commandments of God, which we see here in Genesis chapter 5. Okay. And you might say, well, you know, I didn't grow up in a Christian home. I didn't have Christian parents. You know, I don't get the benefit of being passed down this from generation to generation. Yeah, but you can start it now. You can start it with your children and your grandchildren and so on. Okay, let's look at verse, let's go back to Genesis chapter 5 now. Genesis chapter 5 verse 6. Genesis chapter 5 verse 6. And this is just, I just want you to see the pattern here in verse number 6. And Seth lived 105 years and begat Enos. So Adam was 130 when he had Seth. Seth was 105 when he had Enos. And why they waited so long? It's just, it seems like it's their biology, right? I mean, you'll see this. you start to see the time they have kids will start to decrease, okay? But 130, 105 here. So I don't think there's anything wrong with them. It's just the way their bodies were. I mean, I don't know what it'd be like if we lived for 900 years. You know, I don't know how, how long it would take for our bodies to develop. Obviously, it'd be very different to the way we are today, okay? Verse number seven. I guess there'd be no rush. I mean, if you're living for 900 years, 
I guess you're not really in a rush to have kids anyway, right? I mean, the body will, will determine when the right time is anyway. Verse number seven. And Seth lived after he begat Enos 807 years and begat sons and daughters. And all the days of Seth were 912 years and he died. And Enos lived 90 years and begat Canaan. So now we have Enos living 90. He was 90 years old when he had Canaan. And Enos lived after he begat Canaan 815 years and begat sons and daughters. And all the days of Enos were 905 years and he died. And Canaan lived 70 years and begat Mahalalel. Okay, so 70 years. We see this drop keep coming, right? But still, I mean, it's very old, right? It's still, for, for us, for the way we look at it, you know, it's very old. But for them, I'm probably sure it's just, it's just the right time to have kids at that age, right? Verse 13, And Canaan lived after he begat Mahalalel 840 years and begat sons and daughters. And all the days of Canaan were 910 years and he died. And Mahalalel lived 60 and 5 years and begat Jared. And Mahalalel lived after he begat Jared 830 years and begat sons and daughters. Oh, sorry, Mahalalel was 65 years old when he had Jared, right? And then verse 17, And all the days of Mahalalel were 890 and 5 years and he died. And Jared lived 160 and 2 years and he begat Enoch. And Jared lived after he begat Enoch 800 years and begat sons and daughters. And all the days of Jared were 960 and 2 years and he died. And Enoch lived... 60 and 5 years, so you keep seeing this pattern slowly dropping. Enoch lived 60 and 5 years and begat Methuselah. Now let's focus our attention on Enoch. So we see all these names. We don't know much about them. We don't really know much about them. I know some people have sort of gone look at the meaning of their names and come up with things. Uh, I mean, yeah, I mean, I guess, I guess that's, that's profitable, you know. But what we see here is the Lord pauses at Enoch, and he has something important to tell us about Enoch, okay? It says here in verse 21, and Enoch lived 60 and 5 years, oh sorry, what am I up to? Verse 22, I think. And Enoch walked with God, so let's look at this. And Enoch, Enoch walked with God after he begat Methuselah 300 years and begat sons and daughters, and all the days of Enoch were 360 and 5 years. So Enoch lived 365 years, so that's a long time. Now, but when you look at everyone else, he lived the shortest. Okay, why, why? It says in verse 24, And Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. Okay, so Enoch did not die a natural death like his forefathers. He was taken by God. Okay, he walked with God, he was taken by God. Say, so why was he taken by God? Glad you asked. Keep your finger there. Go to Hebrews chapter 11 now. Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 5. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 5. The hall of faith once again. It tells us a little bit more about Enoch here in the New Testament. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 5. It says, By faith Enoch was translated that he should not see death. You see, God took Enoch... He enjoyed his fellowship so much. He enjoyed walking with Enoch so much. Enoch was so godly. Enoch was so faithful that God said, you know what, Enoch, I'm going to reward you. You're not going to see death. And he took him. He took him to heaven to be with him. Okay? So that was the purpose for Enoch, that he would not see death. Okay? He was taken by God. And then it says, and was not found. So it's like, where's Enoch? He's gone. <laughs> He's not found. Because God had translated him, for before his translation, he had this testimony, that he pleased God. What a testimony. I mean, I, I don't know if this is going to happen, but I would love it on my tombstone, right? You know how people write things? I hope people just write, Kevin pleased God. I'd be so happy if that's all he had, right? I mean, he doesn't have, he was the pastor of New Life Baptist Church for this many years, or... <coughs> <coughs> you know, he accomplished all these things in his life this many years. If all my tombstones said that Kevin pleased God, I'd be rejoicing. I'd be over the moon, right? Because I'd be numbered amongst others like Enoch. We need to tr strive to please God. Okay, that's what our lives should be about. We see that God, you know, rewarded Enoch, gave him a special privilege to go to heaven early, okay? Not to see death because, you know, God was, trying to, was withholding him from that. Because he pleased God. Now look at verse number 6. So how do we please God? It tells us in verse number 6. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. 
Okay? In other words, if, if we want to please God, what do we must have? We must have faith in our Lord. You say, yes, I've placed my faith on Jesus Christ. I'm saved. Praise God. That's one way to please Him. Hey, but we're meant to go from faith to faith. We're meant to walk in faith. Like it spoke of Enoch. He walked with the Lord. You know, he walked in faith. He was a faithful man. You know, he always knew that God would answer. He always knew that God was there with him. He maintained a close walk and fellowship with the Lord. And it says, uh, verse number 6, For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. So what does that tell us about Enoch once again? He was diligently seeking after the Lord. Okay? We speak of David being a man after God's own heart. It seems like Enoch was very similar. Always seeking after the Lord. Seeking to be faithful to the Lord. And he was you know, such a standout in this family that God took him and translated him. Now, some people teach that Enoch was raptured. Okay? I've heard people preachers say, well, there are seven raptures in the Bible, for example. There's Enoch, rapture number one. Rapture number two is maybe Elijah when he's taken up in the whirlwind. Just trying to think what they are. You know, number three could be Jesus, you know, resurrection. Number four could be the rapture. Number five could be, I don't know, maybe the Jews rapture or something. <laughs> right? People come up with all these raptures, right? So they say, well, he was raptured here. Well, no, because the rapture is the resurrection. Okay, when we receive, when, we have been, when the rapture time comes, we're going to receive our resurrected bodies. The Bible calls it the resurrection. Okay? Enoch was not resurrected. Okay? And people say, well, no, it means there. It says Enoch was translated. That means he, was, you know, he received his resurrected body and he went up to heaven. He was like an early rapture. And this pictures a pre-tribulation rapture. Right? Because before God you know, uh, floods the earth, before God asks Noah to build the ark, and he destroys the earth, he pours out his wrath on this earth, we see Enoch as a picture of the pre-trib rapture. Well, first of all, he was not raptured. He was not resurrected. Okay? Second of all, he was, he was raptured. Sorry, he was raptured. He was taken of God long before, long before God poured out his wrath. Okay? It's not seven years or anything like that, like the pre-tribbers teach. Okay? Let's understand, what does it mean to be translated? If you guys can go to... Uh, uh, Colossians chapter 1, please. Colossians chapter 1, verse 12. Colossians chapter 1, verse 12. Colossians chapter 1, verse 12. The Bible says, Giving thanks unto the Father, which have, which have made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light, who have delivered us from the power of darkness and have translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. You see, if you're saved, you have also been translated. Okay, so what does it mean to be translated? Well, we talk about Bible translations. We're not talking about taking one language to another language. Though there's a similar uh, etymology behind that. But what it's saying is you're taken from one place to another. When the Bible uses the word translate in that sense, you're taken from one place, you're taken to another place. This is not talking about a resurrection, okay? With Enoch, he was taken from the earth and he was taken to heaven. When you've been saved, God took you, what did it say here, from the power of darkness and he translated you, he's taken you to the kingdom of his dear son, the kingdom of God, okay? The kingdom of God within you, that first phase, the spiritual phase, being born again, that new man has already entered, as it were, the kingdom of God. Okay, you've been translated from the power of darkness. That's what it means. It doesn't mean we've been raptured. It doesn't mean we've, we've, we've been resurrected, as it were. Okay? It just means we've been taken from one place to another place. So don't fall into the trap of saying, well, Enoch was raptured. Well, it wasn't. Okay? And the reason behind this, go to 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 20, please. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 20. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 20, the Bible says, But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. Okay, so we know that Christ was resurrected from the dead. We know that Christ received his resurrected body. And the Bible calls Christ the first fruits of them that slept. Okay, why is that important? Verse 21, For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. Okay? For as in Adam 
all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. But look at verse, 20, look at verse 23. Hey, we serve an orderly God. Okay? The Bible tells us in verse 23, but every man, every man in his own order, Christ the first fruits. Who's the first to be resurrected? Christ. Okay? Christ the first fruits. Afterward, they that are Christ's at his coming. That's the rapture. Okay? So all of you, all of us, will receive resurrected bodies at his coming. Hey, that's going to include Enoch. That's going to include all the Old Testament saints. At his coming, they're also going to receive their resurrected bodies. All right? Are they in heaven now? Yes, they are, but then they're without their resurrected bodies. They're in heaven by, in soul and spirit. But one day, at the resurrection, they're going to receive their uh, new bodies as much as we are. Okay? And then it says in verse 24, Then cometh the end. So at the end of all these things, it says, When he shall have delivered up the kingdom to God, this is at the end of the millennium, even the Father, when he have put all rule and uh, put down all rule and all authority and power, this will be the final resurrection of the saints that lived after the first rapture. Okay, after the first resurrection, they're going to be resurrected again at the end. All right, but we see that God is orderly. Christ first, then those that is coming, then cometh the end. All right, so Enoch. No, Enoch was not raptured. Okay, yes, he had a special privilege of being taken up to heaven. But he's going to receive his resurrected body at the same time that you are. Okay? It's going to be awesome to, to see Enoch and see these Old Testament saints in the clouds with God forever. All right? Now go to uh, uh, Jude chapter 14, please. Jude chapter 14. Jude chapter 14. Jude chapter 14. Because it's not obvious from the book of Genesis... But Enoch wasn't just a man that walked with God. Enoch was a preacher. Enoch was a prophet. Okay? These are the signs of someone that walks with God. These are the signs of someone who pleases the Lord. These are the signs of someone that has faith in God. Listen, when you have faith in God, when you're pleasing Him, when you're walking in His ways, you can't help but speak His word. You can't help but preach his word. And look, children, ladies, you can all be preachers, not behind this pulpit, but you can all go out there preaching the gospel door to door, okay? This is the sign of a man who walks with God. Jude 14, please. Did I say chapter 14? I always say that. Jude 14, Jude 14, verse 14, of course. Jude verse 14. It says here, and Enoch also, the seven from Adam, prophesied of these, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints. All right? Now, you don't need to turn there. I'm going to read to you from 1 Thessalonians chapter 3. But when does God, when does the Lord come with ten thousands of saints? When? 1 Thessalonians chapter 3 verse 13. It says, To the end he may establish your hearts, unblameable in holiness before God, even our Father, at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, with all his saints. And if you know 1 Thessalonians, it goes into chapter 4 about the rapture. Okay? Say, so, you know, who's going to be raptured? Who's going to receive the resurrected bodies? Already covered it. All of us, including Enoch. Because when, when Christ comes, everyone that has gone to heaven, everyone that has died a, a death here and is in heaven, including Enoch, who didn't die, but he's, including Enoch, they're going to come with the Lord Jesus Christ. It's not just going to be Jesus Christ alone descending in the clouds. He's going to come with the ten thousands of his saints. All right? And they're going to be resurrected first. Those that have passed away, they're going to receive their resurrected bodies first. They're going to be caught up into the clouds first. And then those that remain, the rest of us, if we're still alive during those days, we're going to be caught up together with them in the clouds. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. What did Enoch preach? The rapture. He preached the second coming of Christ. Okay? What else did he preach? What else did he preach? Look at verse number 15. Or, uh, yeah, Jude 15. He preached. So after the resurrection, what's he going to do? To execute judgment upon all and to convince all that are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds which they have ungodly committed and of all their hard speeches which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. So he's preached in verse 15 the judgment of God. Okay, he preached that we're going to be raptured 
Christ is going to come and take his saints with him. And then he says he's going to execute judgment on the ungodly. He preached the wrath of God. Man, Enoch must have been a hate preacher, right? Preaching the wrath of God, coming upon the ungodly. Obviously, that includes the Antichrist and those that take the mark of the beast. We have further information. You know, we probably have more information to us today about all these events than what Enoch, uh, what God had revealed to Enoch. But we see he preached the wrath of God. Oh man, he was preaching the love of Christ. He was preaching the wrath of God on the ungodly. Okay? What does that, that tells us? That preachers that please God, preachers that have faith, they preach on the wrath of God as well. Okay? They preach on the anger of God as well. Verse number 16, it says, These are murmurers, complainers, walking after their own lusts, and their mouth speaketh great swelling words, having men's persons in admiration because of advantage. So it says, these are, these are the people that he preached against. And if you get the context of Jude, you know that this, this was written about false prophets. Okay? Enoch preached against false prophets. Enoch preached against false teachers. Now this is hard for us to wrap our minds around, but what does that tell me? It tells me that even in Enoch's day, so early, so early, right? The seventh generation from Adam, there were already false prophets. There were already false teachers in the world at this time, okay? And we see that God had a man in Enoch to preach against these false teachers, right? To preach against these false uh, prophets of God, all right? And once again, spirit-filled men will preach against false prophets, okay? If you go to church and go, why do, why do we hear about the wrath of God? Why do we keep hearing about His anger? Why do we keep hearing about false prophets? I want to move on. Hey, this is a man that pleases the Lord that preaches these things. If you go to church and they're preaching against the false prophets, they're naming names or whatever, they're preaching about the anger, the wrath of God, you should rejoice. Say, hey, this man pleases God. This man reminds me of Enoch in the Bible, who was taken, who was translated, so he would not see death. Okay? This is what we see in the Bible here in Genesis chapter 5. Now let's go back to Genesis 5, verse 25. Genesis 5, verse 25. We're almost done here. Genesis 5, 25. The Bible says that Methuselah lived 180 and seven years and begat Lamech. So remember, Lamech was the father of Noah. And Methuselah lived, after he begat Lamech, 780 and two years and begat sons and daughters. And all the days of Methuselah were 960 and nine years and he died. So Methuselah was 969 years. He's the man who lived the longest in the Bible, okay? And I believe he died, I didn't check, double check this, but I believe he died uh, the same year of the, of the flood, the flood of Noah. He died in the same year, okay? Let's keep reading, verse 28. And Lamech lived an, an hundred eighty and two years and begat a son, and he called his name Noah. Now this is someone that you're probably all familiar with, right? Noah, saying, now look at this, Lamech was also a preacher. Lamech, Noah's father, was also a prophet. Okay, what does he say when he had Noah? Okay, he had a prophecy to speak of him. He says, This same, so this same Noah, shall comfort us concerning our work and toil of our hands because of the ground which the Lord hath cursed. Okay, so he, you know, Lamech recognized that the, the Lord had cursed the ground, okay, was seen coming judgment as well from God, and he says, this same Noah will comfort us of our work and toil. Say, to work and toil of our hands. Say, what, what's that about, you know? Well, we're looking at this generation of godly men, okay? This generation where the fear of God was being passed down generation to generation to generation. Lamech, whatever God had revealed to him, knew that God's judgment was close, okay? But he said, look, I'm comforted to know that the same son of mine, Noah, will continue the work that we've continued. Is he talking about laboring in the vineyard? Is he talking about laboring, you know, in some job? No, the labor of work that's been passed down generation to generation, the fear of God, the teaching of, 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 of His coming, you know, the doctrines of the Bible, that would be, they would be comforted to know that this will be passed on through Noah. Because obviously we know that Noah would see himself through the flood and he would uh, spawn a new generation of people. Okay, so... You know, one thing we can look at Noah and be thankful that God, 
you know, that Noah found grace in the eyes of God, that Noah was saved, because without Noah, the earth would have been totally destroyed, right? Without Noah, we wouldn't be here. Without Noah, we wouldn't know the teachings of God. They wouldn't have been continuing being passed down. And so just a reminder once again, guys, is how important it is for us to pass down the teachings of God to our children. And you don't need to turn there. I'll read to you from Hebrews chapter 11, verse 7, the same chapter we are looking at before. It says, By faith, Noah, being warned of God of things seen, uh, not seen as yet, moved with fear. Remember we're talking about the fear of God being passed down? Hey, Noah had a fear of God. He had a fear of the judgment of God. It says, prepared an ark to the saving of his house, by the which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness, which is by faith. Okay? So we see that Noah was a man of faith and he prepared an ark for his house. Okay, of course we know that's talking about the ark of Noah, you know, to save them from the floods. Okay? But let's take the spiritual meaning here, guys. Fathers, have you prepared an ark for your house? You know, have your children entered the ark of Jesus Christ? Are they saved? Have you taught them the word of God? And if you have done that, hey, at least you've done the step as Noah has, right? Prepared an ark for his house. It's the same thing. That's the same job that we ought to have, guys. Okay, so our children, we as heirs of righteousness can, and can pass down that righteousness to our, to our children. Let's look at verse number 30 now. Genesis chapter 5, verse 30. Genesis chapter 5, verse 30. And Lamech lived after he begat Noah 590 and five years and begat sons and daughters. And all the days of Lamech were 770 and seven years and he died. And Noah was 500 years old. And Noah begat Shem, Ham, and Japheth. All right, so we'll just leave it there. I don't have much more to add there. We'll go into the story of Noah next week. But I hope you guys try to remember the things we covered at the beginning about the sons of God. All right, so that's going to be important as we get into chapter 6 next week. Let's pray.